And that brings us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks, that is, syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this debate. Uh, David, for the first time, the 10 top candidates on the stage, one night, we don't have two nights of debate. What did you take away? Did one or another help himself or herself? Or what? Yeah, if you go by raw quality, uh, I thought Cory Booker, Amy Klobuchar, and Pete Buttigieg just did the best. Uh, it doesn't seem to help them, no matter how good they do. Uh, but I thought they were competent. They were, were sometimes forceful, sometimes emotional. Uh, they're the sort of candidates that Donald Trump probably couldn't pound down very far. Among the leaders and the people who actually seemed very likely to get the nomination, I thought Joe, Joe Biden, while wobbly a lot, had the best night. Uh, forceful, uh, beginning to hit back at Warren and Sanders on the you're, they're going to take away the private insurance. I thought Warren had a had a quite a good night too. So the fundamental thing, and I guess this is common agreement, uh, nothing really shifted in the debate, but things sort of solidified a little more, and that's probably good for Joe Biden. You agree? Solidified for Joe. I Biden? don't. I don't agree with David. Uh, I think he's uh, too glib and too. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, uh, Judy. Uh, somehow, since the last two debates. Uh, uh, the Democratic candidates uh, discovered uh, that uh, there had been one Democrat since Franklin Roosevelt who twice won the White House with over 50 percent of the vote. His name was Barack Obama. He was the big winner last night. All of a sudden, he became the most popular guy. Everybody wanted a piece of Barack Obama, which worked to Joe Biden's advantage, because Joe Biden is obviously the closest in everybody's mind and in actuality uh, to, to uh, Barack Obama. Uh, so I, I, thought, I thought that, to me, was the most. There wasn't a game changer, I did not believe. I think Elizabeth Warren set out. Uh, she, she's got probably maximized her support based upon her plans and ideas, um, which are, let's be frank, if a Senate will not pass with 93 percent support in the country, the background checks will not pass it. Uh, the likelihood of passing these comprehensive sweeping changes is remote at best. Uh, but at the same time, she filled out her Personal, personal resume. She's been all message and little messenger. I thought her messenger part was filled in last night uh, very well. Bernie Sanders is all message uh, and, and, and not messenger. I don't argue with David and his, uh, his assessment of uh, who did well. I thought Pete, Pete Buttigieg... Who did you think did well? I, I, thought, I, thought, uh, I thought Biden had a good night in the sense that he went in as the leader and came out as the leader uh, with wobbly moments. Um, he's not... Uh, He's not somebody who's going to let you guard down at all times. Um, I, I, I do think that uh, Buttigieg had a, a good night. He is, he is as disciplined and as thoughtful and as coherent mm -hmm. as anybody. In his answer on national security, he used his credential as a military person, I thought, the most thoughtfully. I thought the Democrats were pretty shallow on national security. Um, and I thought Buttigieg, uh, on his argument that it should be a re upping every three years of an authorization of military, use of military force by the Congress. The Congress has been missing in action for 18 years yeah. since we went to I'd war. Say Mark's reference to Obama reminds me of the, where the party's center of ideological gravity is. I think some of the earlier debates, Obama and sort of that kind of Democrat was seen as complicit in the status quo, and therefore that all had to be torn down. Yeah. Uh, and now Obama's seen, well, no, he, the, he's, he was a, a very progressive guy. Uh, but not as progressive as the Sanders-Warren wing. And so what you saw was a bit of resurgence of the normal progressive center. Uh, and Biden's poll support suggests that's a real thing, in part because a lot of African-American voters are not quite as progressive on some issues as the Warren-Sanders wing, mm -hmm. and they're sticking with Biden. Uh, and so you saw the, the Klobuchar's, the Buddha judges begin to hit back, on, especially on this health care issue, where they said you're limiting people's choices. Uh, you who want to put everybody into one system. And then the second dynamic is that sometimes people on the, on the left, if we want to put it that way, hit Biden in ways that attract sympathy for Biden. Uh. And that we saw that with the Castro exchange. We saw with the protesters late in, late in the debate when Biden was talking about his <coughs> late wife. Um, and sometimes some of the attacks become so vitriolic, people say, wait, I like Joe Biden. And it redounds to his benefit. It is, it, it, yeah. There's a reservoir yeah. of good feeling for Joe Biden, and I think, I think we saw that among Democrats uh, last night. Castro was on everybody's short list for vice president until he wasn't. 
uh, and he, uh, I think, uh, you think he, last I think, I think he, he, he was the queen of mean. He was Leona Helmsley of the Democrats. I mean, that was a, Whoa. it was really, uh, I mean, he didn't just, it wasn't just a throwaway line. He came back and repeated it twice to make sure you got it. He said uh, it wasn't personal. It, it wasn't but, personal. Who was he but, talking about? I'm sorry. Was he missing, did I miss somebody in this? Yeah. Uh, he was talking about the institution. Um, but, uh, so no, that, that just, uh, that did not, that did not work. Uh, but the, the one organic moment of real humor in the whole evening was Cory Booker when he said, I'm going to, my answer is no. Was he, was he talking about he's going to oh. impose his vegan tastes upon uh, <laughs> beef eating Texas. Uh, and, and he said no, and I'll translate that into Spanish no. I mean, uh, that, that, it was good. I mean, uh, Amy Klobuchar had some good lines, but they were good lines. I mean, right. his, his was organic, and I, I, I give him credit for that. Uh, but somehow it just doesn't come together for Cory Booker. Yet. Another piece of politics this week, just quickly, uh, David, was that, that uh, makeup uh, race in North Carolina, the 9th Congressional District, a do-over. The Republicans won. They held on, but by a much narrower margin than what we saw President Trump yeah. take that district uh, in 2016. Is there a message here Repu for Republicans? Yeah. I mean, it could be that there's a message. I mean, it was Trump won it by 12, and then they now carried it by two, so that's not a good thing. Uh, but uh, my bias is that we tend to cover local races with a strictly national perspective and that we see it only as about Donald Trump. But the Republican Party behaved pretty disgracefully in this race in 2018 with corruption and all this stuff, which is why we had to have a do-over. And so it could have been in part also just personal sickness with the Republican Party. And McCready, who was the Democrat, uh, did not do better. He did worse in rural areas than he did in the first version of this election. Mm -hmm. And that highlights the core problem for, for Democrats in places like that, which is they've got to get out of their core and start winning over people in the more rural areas. And they're still not quite able to do that. And McCready is a very good centrist candidate, good for that district. Some, some bleeding among Republicans, for Republicans, Mark, in the suburbs around Charlotte. Big. Uh, and, and so is that something, I mean, is David right that this is, this is more local, it's different because it was a congressional race, or is that something Republicans nationally should worry about? Republicans have to worry about it. We're going to see it this fall in Virginia, uh, where the, the legislature is being elected in a statewide election. Um, Judy, the, the, the Mecklenburg County, which is the heart and soul of Republican, the greater Charlotte area, 13 uh, percent McCready won by. David's absolutely right uh, that the Democrats, the, these are historically Democratic areas. Take Robson County. Barack Obama got it 58 percent. Uh, one time, 57 percent another time. John Kerry carried it. Uh, this is where Donald Trump actually carried it over Hillary Clinton. And those, those conversions, if you will, those white rural Democrats mm. left the Democratic Party. Um, they barely broke for McCready. I mean, he should have carried that county big uh, on, uh, on Tuesday for the Democrat. Uh, he didn't, I, I think, Republicans have a big suburban problem. Democrats have that white rural problem, and, it, and it's real. But they have voted Democratic in the past, so Democrats can't dismiss it and say, oh, they're all racist, you know, they're all narrow-minded. They voted for Barack Obama uh, in that, that county, Robson County. Let me ask you about what happened at the White House this week, David. The president has parted ways with yet another national security advisor uh, representing just the latest sign of uh, a lot of turmoil in, in his foreign policy, national security uh, staff. Is this just the typical Washington turnover? Or is this something the American people should be worried about? Uh, yeah, the Trump administration is always the typical Washington thing. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's um, I mean, in one sense, you sort of give Bolton, John Bolton, some credit that he did stop some pretty bad things. Uh, he seems to have dissuaded Trump from meeting with the Taliban and the Camp David um, and doing a deal with North Korea. Uh, Trump wanted to do deals so he could have nice headlines and a good TV show. Uh, and Bolton seems to be among those who, who uh, slowed him down that, so he gets some credit. Uh, the problem, I think the larger problem, is that the NSC is supposed to be running the process. There are lots of different players in the foreign policy game, the State Department, the Defense Department, the Intelligence Agency, and the NSC is supposed to be running the process to coordinate all this information and so the president can make a decision. But with Trump, there's no process. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are supposed to be meetings, principals meetings, undersecretary meetings, all these different layers of meetings. And apparently that's not happening. And so we have Donald Trump conducting foreign policy in a room. We've got 800,000 people in the intelligence community, 2 million people in the military, Lord knows how many in the State Department. 
all of whom are kind of irrelevant right now because Donald Trump is sitting there watching CNN or whatever he's watching and making foreign policy. And I think that's the scary thing. Scary? Yeah. Scary. Uh, Judy, um, John Bolton never met a foreign engagement that he didn't like. Uh, in my experience. I mean, he loved military confrontation, uh, except when his number came up in the draft and he says, I, I, I confess, I think the war in uh, South Vietnam, in Vietnam is not winnable. Um, and uh, he is, uh, uh, so uh, is, you know, he confessed he had no desire to, to fight in it, um, which, you know, being an armchair commando, you think might inhibit him from sending other people's children uh, into into war, but watching the the, the shootout down or, or the face off between him and Donald Trump was reminded of like being an agnostic at the football game between Southern Methodist and Notre Dame. <laughs> I mean, you, I really, I mean, I wasn't rooting for this side. I mean, he was not a yes man. Trump wants a yes man, um, and he's he is not he was not a yes man. Um, and uh, are you saying that's what uh, Secretary of State Pompeo? I, th I think I think Secretary Pompeo has played Donald Trump like a virtuoso plays a Stradivarius. I mean, to, all the way to the point where Donald Trump uh, gave him credit for making the decision not to wear two hats as Bo Kissinger to be both National Security Advisor and and Secretary of State. So. Uh, he's he he's figured it out just as Nikki Haley figured it out. I mean, uh, and, and got out of the, ambassador. Uh, that, uh, get you a former UN ambassador. So uh, you know, I uh, uh, I'm I'm just not a I'm not going to miss uh, John Bolton. I think he probably did have a sobering uh, influence at, at certain junctures, as David points out. Last thing, quickly, I want to ask you both about is the prospect for any sort of legislation on guns. All these mass shootings, the Democrats are now talking about it. They're pushing legislation. You both talked about it. It came up in the debate last night. David, um, the Democrats are pushing it. Mitch McConnell, the majority leader in the Senate, is saying, I'm not going to do this until I know President Trump is going to sign something. Right. What does it look like right now? Yeah, I think the smart thing to do would be to Marco Rubio and Susan Collins and uh, Angus King and a few other senators have a red flag bill that would that would withhold uh, weapons to people who have set off psychological red flags. And it may seem modest compared to what a lot of people are calling for, that they're going to, um, you know, Beto's going to seize everybody's assault weapons. Um, but it, I think it's important to at least crack the wall of inaction. Uh, and if you get one thing done, then maybe the NRA's wall has been cracked a little and you get other things done down the line. I'm not sure the Democrats see it that way. They may want to have the issue and have uh, some big thing down the line. Uh, Donald Trump has said he'd be open for background checks. Uh, I'm dubious he'll actually do it. Uh, Ted Cruz came out today and said, Saw don't that. waken the Republican base. You don't want to do that. And I wouldn't be surprised if that argument won. 15 seconds. Oh. Judy, this is an issue that's changed. It's been the third rail of American politics. You can't go near it. Guns has changed to violence. Um, I think we saw it with 135 CEOs coming out. I think there's a, I think there's a sea change. I think uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, became the, the public witness and, and, the, and the public source uh, last night in, in, in a very large way. I think America is changing on guns. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you.